Hi, this is Julie with a quick announcement before we begin. If you identify as a woman podcaster, I hope you'll join us for the third season of the Women Podcasters in Solidarity Initiative. Our group recently committed to the topic of immigration from a social justice perspective, and we invite you to come along by committing to record an episode that can shine a light on this important issue. To take a look at past seasons and get more information, visit womenpodcastersandsolidarity.com. Now, on to the show. Hi, and welcome to Mother's Quest, a podcast for moms like me ready to live our own truly epic life. I'm Julie Neal, a life and leadership coach, community builder, writer, and mom to two high energy boys who challenge me to grow into my best mom! self. Mom! <laughs> I'll be right there. Where was I? In the months leading up to a big milestone birthday, I decided it was time to stop sidelining my dreams and realize that I'm the hero of my own journey. I knew I didn't want to do it alone, so I created this podcast to learn from other moms on their own quest, so their words of wisdom and lessons learned could help light the way for mine. I created this podcast for myself. Come along with me, and you'll find some treasures of your own. I'm so honored to bring you this reflective conversation about investing from a place of trust in our dreams of becoming mothers, in our children, and in the causes we believe in, with someone who has been a dear friend and colleague for over a decade, Pia Infante. As trustee and co-executive director of the Whitman Institute, Pia leverages decades of multi-sector experience as an educator, facilitator, organizational development consultant, and more. In her work at the Institute and as a speaker, she advocates for radically embodied leadership and trust-based philanthropy in settings that have included Harvard Kennedy School Center for Public Leadership, Ashoka Future Forum, Net Impact, Council on Foundations, International Human Rights Funders Group, and Skoll World Forum, to name a few. Before Pia joined the Whitman Institute, she and I worked together for years as facilitators of a practice called Adult Reflection, and also supported one another in our own lives as participants in a women's reflection circle. Another member of that circle was Atsuko Kubo, a longtime leader at the organization called On The Move that the Whitman Institute funds. When it came time to invite someone to dedicate this episode, it just felt right for it to be Atsuko. Here she is. Hi, I'm Etsko Kubo, and I'm honored to dedicate this episode of the Mother's Quest podcast to the 30 women who are mothers that work for On The Move. On The Move is a nonprofit organization that develops emerging leaders who address critical social, educational, health, and economic inequities as identified by communities. I am part of this diverse group of women who come to work on behalf of themselves, their children, and communities. So to all of you, Sarah, Shauna, Brenda, Mirna, Fabi, Denisha, Lupita, Bonnie, Sonia, Jasmine, Susie, Kayla, Leti, Ligia, Sandy, Elba, Blanca, Diana, Jennifer, Gabi, Teresita, Tara, Odelia, Amaret, Christine, Edith, Miriam, Carmen, Jeanette, and Maria. I am humbled by your daily contributions to this work, and more so to the hardest job I've ever had, raising children. I have heard your triumphs, your struggles, and your courage, and I'm in awe of each of you who have already led in your homes and are now extending that into your communities through work. And now to Pia Infante. Pia, I first want to acknowledge and thank you and John Esterly for doing what you do at the Whitman Institute. Your work in trust-based philanthropy has helped our organization to be seen as a group of humans working on behalf of communities of other humans. You see me as Etsco, I see you as Pia, and together we strive to make communities better. You from one role and I from another. You also care about what we learn, how we think, 
and what we feel about the work we do. What I so want to eagerly share with you as I close up, Pia, is that you were an immediate big sister figure to me. And normally, I am the big sister. There has always been something about your grace, your bossiness in the best way possible, and your search for your own truth that I've looked up to and hope to be like. My spirit sings that we have children walking this earth at the same time and that we might have the opportunity to continue to support each other as mothers and humans striving to do great work in the world. Thank you, Etsuko, for this beautiful dedication to the 30 women who are mothers that work at On The Move. I listened to your dedication smiling and crying as I heard you share the impact that Pia has had on you. This unique combination of grace and bossiness you talk about and the search for her own truth are qualities I also deeply admire in Pia and qualities which emanate throughout this conversation. I so appreciated the opportunity to uncover lessons about Pia's decade-long fertility journey, her relationship with her mother and her ancestors from the Philippines, her experience navigating the waters of new motherhood, and her perspective about money as energy we can get circulating by investing in organizations and movements over the long term from a place of deep relational trust. The thread of trust weaved through the entire conversation. I hope you leave this conversation as I did, renewed and inspired to trust the unfolding of your own epic life journey of your children's development in their own time and in their own way, and in your own power to invest in the causes that matter to you. I'm Julie Neal, and this is Mother's Quest. Pia, welcome to the Mother's Quest podcast. I'm so happy to have you here. Hey, Julie. Thanks for having me. I'm so excited to be here. I feel like it's been a long time coming. Yes, it always is. And we've had a few bumps in the road along the way to getting to this recording, but it feels right that it's happening today. One thing that's happening for me is I have a brand new puppy who is sleeping next to me. And I know you have a little one who's still under one year old, your daughter. Mm -hmm. And I feel like I am coming back to what it's like to have a young child in a way and to be learning about how to integrate a new life and being into my family and my everyday activities. And I'm excited to kind of learn fresh from you because you've now been on this journey for nine months, Mm -hmm. you being into your life. Mm -hmm. Yeah, she's been out for more now, more time than she was in. So it feels like a particular kind of benchmark that she's nine and a half months old. Yeah. Mm, Yes. That is a powerful time and you're approaching the one year mark. So I'm looking forward to hearing your reflections on motherhood today. I also brought you on because you do incredible work in the world of philanthropy and I want to grow Mother's Quest's impact in terms of bringing resources and contributing, but in a very thoughtful, respectful, aligned way. Mm -hmm. to learn some from you about that. You are one of the people that are just part of my root system. When I think about all that I've learned about reflection and facilitation over a decade's worth, you've been alongside me for a lot of that journey. So let's start with the first question I ask every guest. Tell me a little bit about your own childhood and the impact that your mother has had on who you are today. Thank you for the invitation again and the questions. You know, I think of my relationship with my mother as one that is complex in so many ways. And I look at it now as a 45-year-old very differently than I did as a 15-year-old, 25-year-old, 35-year-old. I was born in the Philippines and one of the first very kind of marking elements or stories of my childhood is that my mother and father left me with, you know, a lot of extended family, my grandmother so that they could start a life in California. And I was one year old at the time, maybe a little less than one year old. And then they came back for me, like not until I was three, actually. So there was this, essentially this separation physically and obviously emotionally as well that comes with that as a very, very young child, which I technically don't remember in terms of actual memory, but I do have a lifelong kind of felt experience of 
the absence of my mother. And so when I did come to the States, one of the phrases that my mom says over and over again is, she says it in our language, which is even more interesting, but in Tagalog, she says like, I'm not like a cuddly, warm and fuzzy kind of mom. You know, I'm the kind of mom that pushed you out of the nest when you were very small and you learned how to fly very soon. And I'm the oldest of three children. And I think that metaphor really resonates to me. Like I did feel like I was grown very early and that in essence, I helped to parent my two siblings who are three and six years younger than me respectively. The impression I've had for most of my life is that my mom is not available to me emotionally. And I think in retrospect, I see how much of a fierce provider she has been, you know, that she was, like how much she elbowed out and edged out in a brand new world, thousands of miles from her people, her home, her land to make a way for us, all of whom she supported to go to college and kind of flower and thrive in the lives that we have. It means that I spent many decades feeling sometimes hurt, you know, mostly hurt, sometimes resentful about the ways that she just didn't get involved in my life, both, you know, in terms of my personal life, you know, I'm queer and she's never been that comfortable with my queerness. She's a very devout Orthodox Catholic, but even in other ways, like she's never been the kind of mom who's a cheerleader at the side of everything I'm doing. You know, she sometimes doesn't exhibit (laughs) that much curiosity in the specifics of my life. Right. And that has felt so hurtful at times. And now I just really see that her way, her stamp of motherhood was about, you know, creating the conditions for a life that I could invent. You know, there's this beautiful quote from my Angelo that said, the birth of my son gave me the courage to invent my life. I think that my mother's priorities, her priorities weren't like cuddling me and like petting my head every time any boo-boo came along, you know? Her priorities were bigger than my imagination as a child, you know, because her priorities were about making sure we had a lot of tools that we needed to create or invent a successful life. And she's had to deal with her own disappointment that the life I invented is not the one she would have invented for me, right? Mm -hmm. She would have cast me as maybe marrying a guy and becoming a lawyer and kind of, you know, she had her own idea of what an epic life would have been for me. Julie, but I feel like what she did give me was like some critical capacities to invent the life that I have that I now enjoy. So at this point in my life, I have like a deep regard and appreciation for her flaws, you know, and her failings, as well as her fierce priorities in terms of motherhood. And I feel like she has been such a shaper of my consciousness and who I am in the world. And I think that in some ways, my own mothering of my daughter now is kind of almost like a mirror to the things that I didn't get, you know, as a child. My dotingness and my kind of need to be kind of present with my daughter, the way that I've structured my world and my life at the moment is that I definitely am a working mom. So I have childcare for like six hours a day. But a lot of my day, my mornings and my afternoons are dedicated to being with Mami Akea. And I think in some ways, it's because I felt an absence there. And I hope that I am able to, you know, hold both the left hand and the right hand together. And also remember that the kinds of capacities that my mother sort of gave me to invent my life. You know, it's funny how formidable she is in my mind. She's now like a 72 year old woman who weighs 95 pounds and is, you know, dealing with end of life stuff. And a heart condition that she has survived for many years. And it's interesting the way that I think about this, like I reflect on how we cast our parents in a particular way, maybe at their kind of most strongest in their lives, you know, in essence, at the sort of height of their vitality and when we're the most vulnerable. But then we have this reverse pattern where they become more and more vulnerable and we're kind of hitting our vibrancy, our vitality. And I remember that the power differentials change. So it's been a real journey to get to here with Ophelia. And one really sweet, sweet thing is that my daughter, Lani Akeo, was born on my mother, Ophelia's mother's birthday. And her mother's is Regina. And she actually wanted me to name my daughter Regina because it means kind of like queen or royalty. But 
even the fact that she's so touched by that, that she wants to be involved and to know my daughter who is being born into a family structure that she really doesn't quite comprehend. You know, two women making a life together, you know, raising a child together is not part of the vernacular of her consciousness. Mm. And so the sweetness of her, like, wanting to FaceTime with her or like wanting to like give her clothes or like even wanting to give her a name as kind of like a transgression of boundaries that that may seem to be, it feels really sweet to me because, you know, it's been a lifetime of her being pretty distant, not trying to get too involved in anything related to me. So for her to have investment in and want to participate in Lanya Kea's life, it feels like a very sweet denouement to the other hardships we have faced in our relationship. Wow, what a beautiful reflection. I'm struck by the complexity of it. And when I think about knowing you for all these years and how your stories of building your relationship with your mother have unfolded over the years, I really appreciate your ability to both hold like the softness and the welcoming and the love and also the boundaries. I see the formidableness in you as well. I think mm. she passed that on. Mm. And she would argue that if she had been like a coddly type helicopter mom, <laughs> that, you know, some of the things that I think are the ways that I show up in the world might not exist. Mm -hmm. And I think it's an interesting dialectic between us, you know, and I think that it's a huge exploration with my own daughter. Like, can I be, I don't want to be a helicopter mom, but can I be more available emotionally? Can I be more involved in her life? and also allow her to be what she is. And I feel like despite lots of arguments over the years about my mom wanting me to be different, like wishing the shape of my life was different because it didn't match her understanding her values, I actually feel like she did give me the freedom to become myself, right? Even if it sometimes felt like in direct opposition to what she wanted me to become, it never stopped me from becoming myself. And when I look at how Lania Kea is, I just can't imagine being able to stop her from being what she is. I mean, she is a powerful little powerhouse already at nine and a half months old. You probably think that's about your children. It's like they are what they are, you know, from the very, I mean, she opened her eyes like after a drug-free birth and was so just there and curious. She was like, what's happening now? You know, she was so alert. You know, people talked about her as a young baby, like even like a two week old, a three week old, a three month old. Wow. Your baby's so alert. Like she's already here. Like, whereas some people talk about those newborn months as like the babies are still transitioning in their fourth trimester, you know, or fourth part of their journey to coming to this planet. I feel like she just landed alert and she has only since then just continues to grow into like what she is. So it's pretty fascinating. Well, I actually want to bridge these two conversations now to start to talk about what I call the epic guideposts. You've heard me share, you've been alongside me as I've been growing Mother's Quest. So you know that epic has this connotation of inventing our lives, you know, mm -hmm. stepping in, being the authors of our story and really living the lives that are filled with the things that matter most to us. And then Epic is also an acronym mnemonic for the guideposts that I think help us to live those kinds of lives, especially mm -hmm. when we're raising our children. Mm -hmm. So the first guidepost E is about being engaged mindfully with our children. You've already started to share some light about how you hold this. I'd love mm -hmm. to hear a little bit more. And also, if you can share what you feel like were your biggest lessons learned on the path to having your daughter. Mm. I know we have shared experience of many, many years of fertility challenges and not being able to get pregnant right away. So mm -hmm. what are your thoughts on this guidepost? Yeah. And first of all, I love the guidepost. And I forgot that a part of it is that having, you know, following these epic guideposts allows us to invent our life. And it's just such providence that I literally just listened to Maya Angelou read a portion of her book, A Letter to My Daughter. And that's where that quote comes from that I mentioned earlier. It's an epic process <laughs> that had us land here with this little being in our world. I'll say that for queer women, it's not always just a fertility challenge. It's also that we don't have the kind of inventory, right? That heterosexual couples may have. Again, not every couple has that. But for us being two women, we certainly had the first 
part of our journey was to figure out donorship. But not to go into all the specifics of the story, I will say that the 10 years of imagining, visioning, trying, failing, all in different ways, and including all the things, you know, all the drugs, IVF, the going into do IVF, the going into debt. I mean, we made the last payment on our failed IVF from 2014, probably like two months ago. <laughs> so it's incredible to me. But all the, I will say all the investing in is also if money is energy, and we're going to talk about money hopefully today. If money is energy, we've been investing in the bank of Lani Akea for a long time. And part of our story is that we had given up maybe every woman on this journey at some point is like, you know what? It's out of my hands. I really, really, really want this, you know? And yeah. we had given up, but there had been one vial of donor sperm left at the place we were working with, the clinic we were working with, that we couldn't quite bring ourselves to sign the paperwork to throw that material away. So from 2014 to 2018, we paid $45 a month <laughs> for like tiny little, literally like way less than an ounce, right? Of material, frozen material. And we kept saying like in 2015, 2016, we're like, you know, we should just like sign the paper because we're past this now. We're going to be awesome aunties. We're going to travel the world. We're going to have all this, you know, we're going to live the life that we can live without children, right? Which is also an epic life. It can be an epic life. And so we would pretty much had that decision. But when I went home to the Philippines, in 2017, I got a really strong, also, I spent a month with my mother revisiting the places of her childhood. And it was incredibly spiritually powerful. And I felt like one of the clearest messages I got from that was how to reorient myself in relationship to my mother as she looks at the end of her life, but also that I'm supposed to, like, I was like, oh, I am actually supposed to birth, like, I'm supposed to give birth, like, I'm supposed to, like, my ancestors have like downloaded a bunch of messaging to me while I was there. And I'm like, oh shit, like I do have to do this. So I went home and went back to my wife and I said, can we put this back on the table? And she actually was pretty receptive. So for the year of 2017, we kind of brought it back to the table. And then we actually found a person who was willing to be a live donor. He is a beautiful, beautiful man. And he was like, so ready, so engaged, gay man who wanted to contribute to a family and then be part of it as maybe an uncle, a donor uncle, as we say. So we had all of that lined up to go for 2018, but we had this one little vial of sperm. <laughs> so we said, like, let's kick off our process in 2018, which we, of course, were told, because I was 42 years old at the time, maybe even 43, we were told this is going to take a while. This could take all year to find a viable egg. So just like you know, get ready for the ride. And so we were totally ready to take the entire year to give it, quote unquote, our last best effort with this beautiful person as our donor. And we just decided to, quote unquote, kick off the process with a situation, an at-home IUI with frozen sperm from 2012 <laughs> that had a 3% chance of working. So it was like literally like hardly any skin in the game, really. It was March of 2018. And that single first try at home IUI with this little tiny vial that we had invested our energy, right? Our money and our energy in for five years or more. That's Lanya Kea. So when I think about that, I think that kind of engagement with the process is how we got to be in the position to be parents. And in a way, I think that is kind of a mindful engagement with the process because mindful engagement to me, to try to define that for myself is being really present, you know, with our intention and our vision and our energy without being super duper attached to every facet of the outcome. And I think as a very young parent, because I think of myself as a beginner, right? Like I'm a newborn parent and I'm certainly a newborn working mom. I think mindful engagement with my daughter is that, is being present to who and how she is. Of course, keeping all the responsibilities in mind, you know, uh, providing for her the way parents do and we hope to do. But that mindful engagement piece is to me about not getting attached to outcomes that I may want. So just as an example, I remember when she was like four months, four or five months old, I was like studiously reading mommy blogs about tummy time. And she like hated being on her stomach, right? Like every time I flipped on her stomach, she would just start screaming and she just didn't like it. And 
I remember really stressing out about, this is just one example of the many, many things I stressed out about as a new mom. And I would be like, oh my God, I'd say to my partner, she's not doing tummy time. I think that's going to delay her like developmental progress. <laughs> I went to a tummy time workshop and I got her like some tummy time toy things and she just never did it. And then at some point when she was like six or seven months old, she started showing a lot of interest in not necessarily tummy time, but kind of becoming mobile on her hands and, and feet and knees. And now she's like crawling everywhere all over the house, right? And I think that taught me because I don't think I was mindfully engaged in tummy time. I think I was like trying to force her into tummy time with this notion that she had to hit this developmental milestone in a particular way or at a particular time. And what I'm really understanding, as most parents know at this point who are further ahead of us in the game, is they're going to develop in the way that they're going to develop, like at the pace they're going to develop, at the time they're going to develop. And being really present for that is part of our job. And it is part of our job maybe to stimulate them or to, again, like what I said about my own mother, like create the conditions for them to develop and thrive. But I think mindful engagement is also about not trying to force them into any kind of timeline or understanding that is not their own. She is just so herself <laughs> in everything. Like the way that she's crawling is basically she has, I wish I could show you a video. She doesn't really crawl on her hands and knees. She crawls on two hands and one knee and she keeps one foot kind of like a pivot foot or like almost as if she's in a runner's lounge and she's like pretty much crawling in order to be able to walk. And she uses her right foot as like a way, so she has her right foot on the ground as she's crawling with the rest of her body. And then she uses it to kind of like turn around, to sit down, to pull herself up. So in a way, the crawl she has developed is so fascinating to me because it feels like her body is like, okay, I'll crawl. But really what I'm trying to get to is walking. Like that, that's like what I see, you know, if I just observe her, that's what it looks like to me. And I just find that fascinating, you know, and if she had crawled according to like the little textbook or the online chart I was reading, right, I wouldn't be so like pleased and delighted at the way that she's decided to teach herself how to crawl, you know. So anyways, that's an example for me of mindful engagement. I think the other thing I'll just say about that is like honoring her communication like she's not verbal, but obviously there's a lot of ways to communicate and babies communicate non-verbally all the time. And she's very, very clear. Like she's been clear since she was a newborn. I have felt, and I think most moms do, that I hear and I understand what she is actually saying, <laughs> like all the time, like intuitively, because she's very expressive. But I think mindful engagement is also honoring what I observe and hear and respecting it like not forcing her or not pushing her to do what I want. So I may have thought, okay, I want you to eat six ounces of this vegetable puree or whatever. But she has a very like evident moment of like, okay, I'm done eating. I'm not going to eat anymore, you know? And I feel like I honor that stopping point. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's part of mindful engagement is just treating the being, even though they're nonverbal, they're six months old, they're eight months old, and they're technically your baby and you're allowed to direct or redirect them because you're their parent. I feel like honoring her boundaries, if that makes sense, <laughs> or honoring her wishes feels like an important part of mindful engagement. And also, it also teaches me and shows me all the ways that I can project or push or sort of lay stuff on her that's not really hers. It's actually mine, you know? Ooh, there's so much goodness here. I'm appreciating the power of metaphor, which comes up so much in these conversations. It's just how much your own journey and the way in which you invested in bringing her to this world, how that has become a metaphor for you about how you want to be mindfully engaged with her now that she's here. And then I think this crawl, you know, <laughs> I just love that as an example of you know, your own expectations and releasing of them and her stepping into something that was not even what you could conceive and so much better for where she's trying to go. Mm -hmm. it's really powerful. It's delightful. It's like <laughs> delightful to see like how she dances, how she says yes and no, how she expresses enthusiasm. It's like so much better than any script I could ever write. You know, I mean, she's super, super delightful.
to just pay attention to her. Mm. Well, I want to move into the next guidepost and pull a thread that you already started from the first one about the idea of money as energy Uh and hear about, you know, what has been your life's work, at least in the most recent chapter of your journey Mm -hmm. and what some of the lessons are that you've learned. Mm -hmm. So this guidepost P is about your passionate and purposeful Mm -hmm. impact in the world. Got it. Yeah. Our gravity. I mean, for me, my gravity around purpose definitely shifted when she showed up. I will say that, you know, we've known each other a long time, Julie, and so I've always felt at purpose in social movements, in movements that are addressing the divides and conundrums of our time, especially around inequalities. And, you know, we have economic structural inequalities of such vast proportions. We have ecological inequalities of vast proportions, basically to generate the capital of a tiny percentage of people relies on the suffering really of indigenous peoples, of workers, of mothers, of people not having their basic needs met. So my work and I think our work in life has always been that I feel a responsibility to that because I didn't have to be born into poverty, whereas I could have been. So this is interesting back to my mother. My mother is oddly a Republican who's (laughs) anti-immigration. Oh my goodness. For a lot of different ironies, I think mainly assimilation and wanting to kind of not ruffle feathers in order to preserve what she's managed to build here, which is a middle-class life. I think, you know, she has this kind of political stance that feels pretty odd to me, but it's not if you sort of look at the pattern of you come here, you sort of make something for yourself, and now you have to shut the door, you know, on everybody else who might sort of, you know, get in the way or take away from what you built, right? So weirdly, my mother is about sort of closing the gate of opportunity behind her. Mm. And I'm like, well, (laughs) you know, I do, me and a lot of other people like yourself feel like our job is to actually like abolish that gate or to certainly try to like put our hands and bodies, you know, in the way. So to make sure that the flow of opportunity and wealth and abundance is shared, right? So it has always felt that way. I did start out as a teacher. I did start out doing youth development. That's kind of when we ran into each other. I had my own business for a while as a consultant, which also was pretty successful in different ways and surprising ways to me. I think that what I want to talk about, especially around the money is energy piece, is that I landed in a role where I am a steward of resources, right? I'm a funder, so I'm on the other side of the table from where I had always found myself. And I landed in a really special institution called the Whitman Institute that you also know that decided in 2012 to spend out its endowment, which is another, to me, is a brave call. Like one brave call I would have to anyone who sits on a lot of money (laughs) is let's get it circulating. Like, you know, if we were saving for a rainy day, it's definitely raining. It's Hurricane Dorianing. It's, you know, there's all kinds of metaphorical storms hitting the most vulnerable people on our planet and our communities. So it's the time to circulate that energy. It's time to move that money. So the Women Institute decided to spend out its endowment. We asked our nonprofit partners, what's the best thing we can do in our final 10 years, right? To a powerful um, question. You know, what is the best thing we can do? But we didn't ask, you know, consultants and we didn't ask academics. We asked our nonprofit and community partners. And what they and you may have at the time been part of this chorus said was the way that you give money, share energy is markedly different from most of our relationships with other funders, right? You give multi-year unrestricted support. You don't burden us with proposals and reports. You actually want to learn from us instead of oversee us, right? You enter into these partnerships and long-term collaborations in a spirit of service. You listen. You operate in a really different way, both in terms of your structures and policies as a grant maker, but also the way you show up in the relationship. Because in my sector, there are tons of foundations and donors that say that they're about ending inequality. And yet when you relate to them, (laughs) right, the actual lived experience actually feels really at odds with those values. So what we were charged by our partners to do was to go out and see if we could inspire and catalyze funders and donors to just be different in these relationships that are fraught with power differential. And one of the ways that I think about what is now called trust-based philanthropy, which is really just because the word trust came up so much in the interviews that the Mm. Center for Effective Philanthropy did of our grantees, they had a word cloud and trust was the biggest word. 
And the Center for Effective Philanthropy does hundreds of these for foundations, right, every year. And they were like, we've never seen this before. We've never had nonprofits who are anonymized. There's no one that's going to know who said what. So many of them say that they trust you more than they trust most of their funders. So that's where the concept of trust-based philanthropy came from. And I think of trust-based philanthropy as like training wheels for power sharing. So because I think there are huge critiques of the philanthropic sector that you can read books about right now. You know, Edgar Villanueva's book, Decolonizing Wealth, you could read Winners Take All. And they are smart, like really specific critiques of the way traditional philanthropy is set up or billionaire venture capitalism is set up. I think what we offer is in between like sort of burning down the sector (laughs) and reimagining it, there are things we can do today, like right now, to behave differently as the people who have more power and money in different situations and relationships, right? So we have kind of strategic, tactical kind of systems, systems elements you can put in place, but we also have an invitation to literally be in the relationships differently. Mm. And from, you know, really basic things, like instead of always expecting a nonprofit partner to come to your foundation office, right? At the time that is most convenient to you as the funder, like the opposite, you know, what would be the easiest for you? Like what time of day should I come meet you at wherever your programming is happening? Sort of turning that burden of expectation around proving a nonprofit is an aligned partner, like just doing the homework ourselves, doing the due diligence on our own, and really honoring the leadership of nonprofit leaders and community members to give them the space to lead the way that they want to lead versus to play act. Like a lot of people talk about how the relationships with many of their funders are pantomimes. You know, they just say what they think the funder wants to hear. They know the funder's not reading their reports or their applications. They know it's sort of this pantomime dance, you know, that they're doing to pretend that the funders due diligence. And I think on the funder donor side, for some folks, especially in professionalized philanthropy, there's a real commitment to stewarding money, you know, responsibly, right? Which I value. I really value that. My question is, does that always have to look like a 10-page application and a 10-page annual report? Does it always have to look like these really constrictive, you know, Vule will talk about it at length. I think his post from today was about abolishing grant applications. But I could go on and on in this area. But I will say that if money is energy, then what I believe right now is that the world needs energy that's being shared in a power-sharing way that demonstrates the values around ending inequality in the process and relationship and structure of how the money is given away as much as it needs like the missions and the strategies of these foundations and nonprofits. And I think money as energy is also being used in really harmful ways right now. And I think that one of the antidotes to that is circulating it bigger and wider. I would love to see every foundation consider spending out and every foundation consider power sharing with the communities they feel accountable to. I mean, my last question for anyone who is listening from my sector is, like, who are you accountable to as a foundation staff or professional? If your answer is my board, then I would say, like, really ask yourself if that is the right answer right now. (laughs) You know what I mean? Anyways, I'll stop there because I could say a lot about this area of my life, but I feel like I didn't imagine that I was going to end up on the funder side. I feel like I'm a funder advocate or a donor organizer as much as I am a funder at this point. Mm, but donor yeah, organizer. I love yeah. That. But now that I'm here, I do feel like my experiences as a teacher in high school, as a youth developer, right? As a consultant, coaching, nonprofit leadership, doing organizational and systems change work within nonprofits, large and small, like what ones that we used to share as partners, Julie, I feel like all of that actually has been, you know, my own training wheels, my own training ground for being able now to relate in a human way to my peers and colleagues who are donors and funders, not in a shame on you or I'm perfect, you should do it our way kind of way, but in a really relational way. Yeah. I'm really trying to understand what people's motivations are and then really try to insert these like what I think are big, important, ethical questions of our time, which essentially is when I look at my daughter in the eyes when she's 30 years old and, you know, the sky has been burnt purple and we're all breathing through gas masks, I want to be able to say, I did everything I could do. (laughs) You know what I mean? Like that's the time that we're in. There are two things I want to pull out that I'm integrating as I've been hearing you before we move to the next guy post. Mm -hmm. The first is I'm thinking about 
two people who have been teachers of mine over the last few years and who I've had the honor of being in conversation with on the podcast, Nicole Lee, who I recently connected mm-hmm. to, and Desiree Attaway. And one of the things that they often talk about is that the liberator cannot use the oppressor's tools. Mm-hmm. And that was really coming to the forefront for me as you were talking. Mm-hmm. And the other thing is, you know, bringing this back to lessons learned about how to show up as a mother and a parent. I think there's this thing too about contributing or investing with intention, but not holding so tightly to expectation Mm -hmm. that Mm -hmm. I see too in the gifting of money and investing in people and causes and not feeling like you should be controlling the outcome. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, I think that when we find, and this is not to say that we shouldn't do some diligence around who we want to invest in or partner with. But I think that once we do, and if we do trust the leader, the group, the community, then I think it's sort of like our job is to just put gas in their tank, not to tell them use this GPS or only buy this map. And I think that's unfortunately how a lot of philanthropy is set up and even individual donorship can be set up. Like we think that because we're contributing resources that we should be, you know, sort of meddling with the compass. Right. And I don't think that's true. I don't think money gives us the power and privilege to dictate the trajectories of the work. In fact, I think we learn more if we say, how about this? Can I put gas in the tank? And then can I ride along sometimes and learn what you're learning? You know, so it's not that I'm saying, okay, funders, donors, just like anonymously leave your money on a tree stump. You know, (laughs) I've heard that said before. So because you never know who's going to find that money and whether they're going to use it well, you know, but I think that once you find partners that you really trust in the communities or the issues that you really care about, then I think saying, can I help put gas in the tank and can I jump in the car periodically to learn what you're learning? Because what you're going to learn is so different from what I can see from my vantage point, you know, as a donor or a funder. Yeah. One other thing, which is again, a lesson from both Nicole and Desiree, they talk a lot about non-transactional relationships. Right. And as I'm hearing you talk about the relationship that you have with people that you're contributing, you know, the gas into their tank, Mm -hmm. it really is mutually beneficial. There's trust building that's going in both directions. Yeah. A commitment to learning, it sounds like, from both sides. Yeah. We've talked about a lot of money is transferred transactionally. Like, I'll do this if you give me this amount of money. It's very limiting to the imagination. And if we have to keep sort of doing that dance every year, we don't get the runway of just someone, you know, I've said in different plenaries I've done, I think that the default minimum term grant should be 10 years. Because the kind of change that we're trying to support through these donations, through these charities and gifts, they're not the kinds of things that can be changed overnight. I mean, we're talking about for some, of you know, immigration, education, you know, poverty, like these require more than a decade, right, to see some of the outcomes that we want. So I think it builds more creativity and imagination if we just get into a long-term relationship of mutuality where both sides are, are really learning and partnering. I think there are other arguments that would hope that at some point philanthropy would just endow, you know, $500 bazillion or something to community groups to sort of lead on their own. But in the interim, I feel like what we're offering with what we're doing at the Trust Based Philanthropy Project is here's something you can do today. And I think that that's a helpful Like, here's a step you can take today feels manageable, whereas like trying to convince, you know, all the billionaire philanthropies to like seed control and transfer all that wealth to communities feels like a long-term project that other people are up to. Well, I am so grateful that we spent this time on the first two guideposts because I feel like it was so, for lack of a better word or pun not intended, rich. (laughs) But I do want to touch briefly on the next two guideposts. I know we're Mm -hmm. limited on time. But let's do these next two in a little bit more lightning round style. Mm -hmm. So the next guy post I stands for invested in yourself. And Mm -hmm. it's about the self-care, the commitment to your own growth and learning, to bringing things in your life that bring you joy. Mm -hmm. Um, that are really necessary to even be able to do the first two guy posts in your life. Mm -hmm. What would you say is your biggest lesson learned or lesson you're learning now? Whichever Mm -hmm. is more resonant for you on this guidepost? Yeah. I mean, before I got pregnant, I felt like I was absolutely the queen of, um, <laughs> of self-care. I think that 
since she's arrived, it's a new and different kind of challenge for me to make time for myself and make time for myself creatively, make time for myself, just like even physically. Like it's a grind to be a mom of a little one this small. And even as I get bigger, it's such a grind. And so actually it's one of my challenges in the moment is how to invest and create more time for myself, especially around creativity, I think. Certainly like every postpartum mom, I'm like, everything's the same, but my brain and my waistline, I definitely want to, you know, be able to revisit my wardrobe at some point. But I think more importantly, the life that I want to model for my daughter is one that has immense creativity. And so one of my questions for myself, which I don't actually fully have the answer to is, now that this 10-year, 11-year project called Lanya Kea is here, and it was definitely a creative outlet, you know, what else is there for me that I feel called to create? And I don't fully have an answer yet, but I have some inklings of the kind of space, how to create that space. And part of it is also trusting other people to take care of her. It's been a big, you know, challenge and learning for me that I want her to be cared for exactly the way that I could care for her. But again, that's not possible. You know, even my wife can't do that. Certainly her aunties or her other care providers can't do exactly what I would do. So just letting go of that and really embracing the help that's available is one major thing. It's like I really do want to have a wide community. And also I heard two pieces of great advice. Don't forget that you're also a creative source in this world and that if you invest in that, that's the best kind of modeling you can do for her as a young woman. And then secondly, she actually needs a lot of other kinds of care than the care that you're going to provide, right? Because I want her to be exposed to all different kinds of styles and people, of course, that she's safe with. But like, that was really great advice that I'm also working to implement in this kind of I column Mm -hmm. around investing trust that she doesn't always have to be with me and that sometimes being not with me is great for her growth and development. Yeah. And I think about, I remember you talking about how much you loved your grandmother Mm -hmm. and time that you spent visiting her in the Philippines Mm -hmm. now about the really pivotal role she had in raising you from one to three. Mm -hmm. What an impression that makes and how important that is. Mm -hmm. Well, you're starting to bring us to the last guidepost already, which is C, and it stands for connected to a Mm -hmm. strong network so that you Mm -hmm. are not alone on your journey. Mm -hmm. What reflections are coming to you about that guidepost? I really wanted to find a, a place to say this in our interview, which is that When she was born and I was 43 years old, I think, I think I was 43 years old, and I had lived many years of feeling pretty capable in a lot of areas, I felt an immediate sort of vast sense of both like huge love and then like infinite love and then terror. (laughs) Like I felt love and terror simultaneously from the moment she popped out. And that love and terror made me feel incredibly vulnerable and incredibly incompetent. What I'm getting at is after many years of adulthood of feeling pretty like I could land on my feet in almost any situation, I definitely was like on my ass and felt completely incapable. And, you know, was also, I also had postpartum depression. You know, it was really, really difficult for a while for me to care about anything, to taste food, to like find joy in anything other than being with her. I remember my partner's like super into basketball. And one day when the baby was a few months old, she was like watching a basketball game on mute. And she was like, so into it. Like she was jumping up and down on her team. You know, she was like, so passionately into the game. And I've also loved basketball with her for many years. And so I was looking at the TV and I just couldn't care. (laughs) Like I couldn't care at all. I just didn't care about the game. I didn't care who was winning. In fact, I envied my partner for her ability to actually care about something other than the baby. I just remember that moment so well because I was so envious. It was like, wow, you're enjoying that game. 
And literally, other than enjoying her, my child herself, for months and months, everything else was anxiety. You know, everything else was like tripping about you know, whether or not she weighed the right amount, whether everything, right? Whether we were doing the right thing in terms of her sleep training. I mean, I was just so anxious. And I had postpartum for sure. And I thankfully sort of talked about it. And I talked about it to my doctors and they sent me to a postpartum mom's group that was basically the beginnings of what I feel like was like crawling out of a swamp. And so I attended weekly for a while, for several months. Every Wednesday, it was just a group of moms. It, it changed, you know, different moms came different days. But it was the very beginning of me starting to even begin to imagine a life where I could even think of taking care of anything other than her, including myself. So that sort of catalyzed me to join kind of a new mom's group that I just signed up for in my neighborhood, got me to begin to sort of trying to make friends. Like what happened because we had our child later than many of our peers. So many of my queer women friends who I was, I think I told you about a group called Baby Buds. It was queer women of color intending to have children that you know, many of their kids are like 10, you know, eight, nine, like your own children are older. And so when I looked to my actual peers, I didn't find any who were in quite the same boat. Everyone could empathize. Everyone had so much love, you know, yeah. but it's really, I can't say this enough to have mom and parent friends whose children are basically the same stage and the same age. It was like I was breathing air. There was something about our kids both kind of like waking up the same number of times at night or, you know, couldn't get them to switch to a bottle or the struggles with breastfeeding or even the struggles around like food doesn't taste like anything. Like talking about that with other women who are literally in the same exact moment of their motherhood was like a gift that keeps on giving. Like I cannot say that enough because, you know, there were family members and friends and colleagues who are just so loving and supportive. But I really, to get out of the swamp, what I felt like were the life rafts were the ones where everyone was in the swamp as well. <laughs> we were all like climbing onto the raft at the same time and sort of discovering that we could. Something about that just gave me so much strength. So yeah, so there's a lot I think more to say. I know we have to wrap, but I think in terms of community, the last thing I'll say is I was devastated that some of the community and friends and family members that I thought were going to be the ones I would lean on ended up not being available or not quite capable or something like that. Like couldn't quite get to that role for me, mm. whether they were in their own depression or getting a divorce or, you know, whatever it was like all of a sudden my imagined assembly of close community members was not what I thought. But what happened was, those folks receded in their availability and then other folks showed up and they were not the folks that I thought or chose, but they were absolutely vital to me sort of like, I don't know, it feels like this process of going from like curled up in a ball in my living room every night crying to like really being able to live this expanded, ever expanding, ever creative life. It's really powerful what you're describing. And again, I just feel like there's so many incredible metaphors that you're offering for what you've been experiencing. I will say I have an episode I want to send to you with Graham Seabrook, who also suffered through postpartum depression mm. and explained very similar experience of really needing to connect to other mothers that were going through the same thing. And now she provides that for other mothers mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. as we do. So I'd love to connect you with her and to yeah. that episode. And I'm so grateful that you have found those connections and that your web of community is expanding. Thank you. And you're part of it, of course. I mean, I always felt like from the very beginning of this process, your parallel journey has been like a light because just to know that folks can move from the struggles around getting pregnant, you know, to like, having grown kids who are playing sports and, you know, just being out in the world as independent little humans is just, I love it. I love seeing kind of what the path before me might look like. Yes. I would continue to love to be a support and light for you. So of course. Please always know you can reach out to me and the Mother's Quest community. I would love for you to be connected there. Yeah. I'm grateful that it exists and it's another circle that I feel like I can join the ranks of. Yes. <laughs>
And this is a great first way to introduce you too. Well, we are actually at the end of our time together, although I would love to talk with you more. So hopefully this will be the first of many conversations that we can have. But at this point, before we end with acknowledgements, there's an opportunity for you to give me and anyone else listening who wants to say yes, some kind of a challenge mm-hmm. to help us more fully live our epic lives. Mm-hmm. So going back to like that little vial of sperm that we invested $45 in for, for so many years, the challenge is if money is energy and you have you know, anything in this critical time in history that you feel like you want to make some kind of impact in, I think no amount is too small. And it's like how we invest our energy. So my challenge would be, what can you invest in monthly with your money, your energy, right? That you think will contribute to Epic Lives for everyone, whatever that may be. What's amazing about having had a post in philanthropy for a while is that I really understand what it looks like to consistently support something over time. You know, you get to grow, you get to grow with it, basically. Maybe there are things that we already give to you monthly in different ways, but I think of it as like in multiple of our nonprofit groups that we support, I'm a monthly donor. And I often think of it as like, if I'm just willing to give up like one lunch, you know, date a week or something, (laughs) I can actually make a meaningful contribution to Epic leaders, to Epic organizations, to like Epic, like trying to contribute to ameliorating the Epic inequalities of our time. I say yes. I love it. I think I'm going to extend that to, to my children. Ooh. We've been wanting to have them make a conscious choice about contributing. And Ryan certainly has made some donations since his bar mitzvah. He has some money of his own. But this intention and awareness about contributing to something over time, I think is really important to talk about with them and invite them to do as well. Thank you. Awesome. I love that idea that it can start early, this question. Yes. Now we end with acknowledgements, which you and I have been in so many circles, ending an acknowledgement before. This is a first in this way, but I want to start by thanking you for the work that you do in the world, for what a thoughtful, fierce, formidable, and also soft champion you are for so many causes. And for reflective space in general, I've learned so much by being in thoughtful conversation with you. And in terms of this conversation, what was coming to me as maybe a title is trust-based philanthropy and parenting. Mm. And I just appreciate all the stories you shared, you know, from the 10-year creative journey of creating Lani Akea to the philanthropy work that you're doing now and to the thoughtful, intentional way that you're raising your daughter. I'm going to really take this thread of trust and the power mm. of reciprocal relationship. Mm. Thank you. This is so special, actually. I'm first just grateful for the opportunity to stop in time, you know, 9.5 months in to this epic motherhood journey. Here's where it's at. My gratitude to you for creating the space for hosting it for being the incredible amount of creativity you know that's gone into the path behind us and in front of us collectively feels really powerful especially around being part of a circle of mothers and specifically julie i want to thank you for being a visionary for the possibility of my epic journey into motherhood and like sort of greater collective universe of humans that you have not even met yet. I really appreciate getting to be part of your story around what you're doing with this and the insights around your observations and questions, even from this interview, I'll be playing around with in my own consciousness for a while. So thanks for framing it up and thanks for conducting it so beautifully. And it feels like an opening, not a closing. So thank you so much. I'm taking all of that in and it's really making my day. And I want to say like in the last week to bring it back to new beings and my puppy, (laughs) I think I've been sometimes on the verge of tears this week at the like enormity of trying to like reshuffle my life and imagine there's been a little bit of like trying to tap back into the inspiration and my purpose Mm. when 
the caring for the beings feels like so much. Mm. Um, and I feel like this conversation has reignited my passion and my connection for this work. Good. I really needed that. Well, thank you so much, Julie. And I look forward to hearing more from the previous interviews and future ones. Yes, we'll continue to have you be part of our community. This is just the start. Thank you so much for coming along with me on this episode of the Mother's Quest podcast. I hope this conversation sparked something that will help you live your epic life. If you'd like to get show notes and learn more about the Mother's Quest community, head over to mothersquest.com. And while you're there, I would love it if you would follow the prompts to subscribe, leave a review, and help us spread the word. I want to end with some words to help light the way on your quest. Seize the day. Love your people. Honor your gifts. Until next time.